Hello everyone, this is our first ecology video, and in this video we're going to talk about community interactions, which is the interaction between different species, as well as the interaction between species and their environment. So the first thing that we want to talk about is where we are. There are different levels of organization on Earth. The smallest organization that you can think of is an organism. And the next level, so that's one individual organism. The next level up is called a population, you need to know the definition for population. A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area. So the key point over here is they're the same species. The next one up is a community. A community is all of the population within a certain area. So that means we're not only talking about one species, we're talking about all of the species living in one area. The next one is called an ecosystem. An ecosystem is uh, the same area as a community, but instead of only counting the biotic factors, the species that are living, we're also considering the abiotic factors, such as the environment, um, the rainfall, uh, grass, soil, well, grass is a biotic factor, soil, um, for example, uh, the pH level of the soil, the amount of minerals in the soil, um, and how the climate works in within this area. So that's an ecosystem. The next one is a biome. The biome is pretty similar to an ecosystem, but it's kind of a, a bigger ecosystem. So as an example, you can have a coral reef as an ecosystem, but a biome uh, is uh, the, the ocean. The, the ocean biome is a much bigger area um, than any one ecosystem. And then the largest one is a biosphere, which is our Earth. You need to know the differences between each one of these and which level is a smaller level and which organization is a higher level of organization. So here are some big questions that we want to answer. How are community structures and how do the interactions of species in a community lead to emergent property? Here's a, since we're talking about different interactions between species, here are different types of interactions that you can have. Um, notice this word right here, it says interspecific. Interspecific meaning that's an interaction between different species uh, instead of having uh, interactions within one species. And here are the different types of interactions that we're going to talk about. There's competition where both, th both different types of species are competing for the same resources and they are both getting hurt. So they're both um, kind of have a neg negative effect uh, due to the competition because if there's no competition, there's an abundant amount of resources, that's good for every single species. But if two species live within the same area, then the competition is gonna lead to the reduction of the population for both species. The next one is called perdition. Um, that's when there's a predator and there's a prey. And of course the predator is the plus one. That's the one that's gaining uh, benefit in this relationship. And then there's the prey, uh, which is the negative, where the prey's population is going to go down. It has a negative effect on the prey. The next one is called herbivory. Herbivory is when you have an herbivore, which is benefiting from this relationship, and then a negative, um, a negative relationship, a negative result happens to the other part, the, the herbs, the, the plants. And then there are three different types of symbiosis and there's uh, facilitation. Symbiosis is when uh, two different species live in close proximity and it could be good for one species. It might not, may or may not be good for the other species. So we'll talk about each one of these and some examples as well. The last one is facilitation. Facilitation is similar to symbiosis where there might be one species that's benefiting because of uh, the living of the other species, but facilitation is when you talk about the two different species are not living in co close proximity. They might be living in the same area, but they're not really depending on each other. If you don't have one of the species, the other one can still live, but, but it might not be uh, living as well as it was before. But they don't live on each other, kind of. So here's the first one, competition. This is a negative, negative interaction. As I noticed, uh, as I mentioned earlier, both types of species are, um, are kind of being harmed due to this relationship because they're both competing against each other. 
um, interspecific, uh, remember, is for between different species, or you can also have conspecific competition, where you have competitions within one species, within a member of the same species. So here's a word that you need to know, niche. A niche is all of an organism's interactions in this environment. So it's the interaction of this organism and another organism. It's also the interaction between this organism and its environment. So a competition limits an organism's niche. So what does that mean? If you have a, uh, a certain species living in, a, in an area where there's no competition, then it can likely grow its population uh, to a bigger area, right? It can take up more space and it can keep on growing its um, population. However, if you have competition for this species, then it's going to limit how well this population is going to grow or how fast this population is going to grow. So that's the, the bottom line. A competition reduces an organism's niche. And here are two words that, um, that you need to know the difference of. The first one is called fundamental niche, and the, the second one is called realized niche. So um, let me talk about this uh, example real, uh, right here, and you can think about which one is a fundamental niche and which one is a realized niche. In this example, this is an experiment that we want to look at. In this experiment, there are two types of barnacles. One lives on the high tide side, so it can only get covered by water when there's high tide. And then there's uh, the other type of barnacle that only lives on the lower tide level of the of the rock so it's submerged in water uh, a lot longer than um, the other type of barnacle so scientists wondered do they live at the part of the rock the low tide at uh, the low tide and the high tide because they cannot survive on the other side maybe this barnacle cannot survive uh, right here and this barnacle cannot survive if it's because both exposed to air um, longer. Um, so they want to test this idea and want, want to find out well, what is happening. Why do they have um, this kind of location of, of habitat? So what they did is that they removed the bottom type, the low tide barnacle, and they found out that these barnacle were able to grow its population into the low tide area. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this barnacle, or both types of barnacle actually, can live at either low tide or high tide area. They only showed um, this a dominance of a certain area because there's too much competition. So this barnacle cannot grow over here because there's this barnacle right here. And this barnacle cannot grow up here because there's much, much more competition up here. So they kind of um, find their own location where they can coexist near each other so there's not too much competition that causes the reduction of um, the population. So here's my question for you. Which one is the fundamental niche and which one is the realized niche? The answer is the realized niche is the first picture, the actual niche, the actual uh, habitat and the interaction between the organism and the environment. So this is what's actually happening. And then the second picture is showing you a fundamental niche, which is the maximum possible niche, right? Um, if, if there's no competition, how much, uh, how can it live, right? So this is the, the, fun, uh, the fundamental niche. So basically, this is showing you the same thing as this second picture called resource, oh, not yet. So resource partitioning, we'll get to that. Um, here are some examples, or here are some effects of competition, the result of competition, right? If two organisms are living in the same area, then there's, there's a lot of competition and there's only so much food um, available. So what's, what can happen? The first type of result is called competitive exclusion. Competitive exclusion means that there are two different species living in the same area and they're competing with each other. The result is only one type of uh, species can actually keep on living and the other type of species is going to go extinct. So take a look at this picture right here. Uh, we have this type of plankton. There are two different species of plankton. If you only have the A plankton, you can see that over time the population keep on growing. 
if you only have the b uh the the s plankton then uh, this uh this population can also keep on growing over time however if you were to have both species together at the same time in the same area um, those populations are going to start rising a little bit at the beginning but then um, the s plankton is going to outcompete the a plankton so the result is the s plankton get to survive and grow its population but the a plankton um, kind of go extinct uh, as time goes on so this is the result of competitive exclusion the two uh, species cannot actually live together one gets outcompeted by the other one the second possible result of competition is resource partitioning so instead of having to share the same resources and having to be outcompeted by one of the, of the species um, the species, the different species can simply live at different places so that they no longer have a competition. They're avoiding the competition. So here's an example. We have different types of lizards. Um, and as you can see, there are, there are many different types of lizards at this area. Um, and the result of competition is that they don't live at the same part of the tree or even the same tree so that they are no longer sharing the same resources. So there's no longer any competition. So that's good for everyone. Um, this last possibility, uh, a possible result of competition is character displacement. So as an, um, as an example, we have uh, beaks of birds at the Galapagos Island for the, for the finches. At the beginning, we have the G, um, so we have this type of bird, and then we have this other finch, G. fortis. And one has a larger beak length, uh, beak depth, and the other one has a smaller beak depth. As you can see, there's one island with only uh, the G. fuliginosa um, finch, and they have a certain beak depth. And on this other island, the Daphne Island, the G. fortis has a similar beak depth. And then there's a third island that has both the G. full and the G. fortis um, finches. And instead of having a similar beak depth, even though they're still the same species as uh, the other two islands, they have um, very distinct beak depths. One has a smaller beak depth than, uh, or, than this other island. And the other one has a larger beak depth than the, uh, the Daphne island. And the reason for that is instead of having to live at different places, so that's um, resource partitioning, you can have a character displacement where uh, through natural selection, one bird is eating, got accustomed to eating smaller seeds and having smaller beaks. And then the other bird got accustomed to have larger beaks and eat, start eating larger seeds. So now they're no longer sharing the same food, the same medium size uh, seeds, and that help the two species avoid competition. So this is a result of evolution. Well, this is a more of a microevolution since we didn't actually create a new species. It's just a change in the allele frequency and changing characteristics. Uh, this next one is a predation. predation. Um, so we have two different species. We have the predator and the prey, so um, it's pretty easy. And here are some effects of predation that you might not know of. Uh, one is coloration, cryptic. Uh, there are two types of coloration. One is called cryptic coloration, and there's the aposematic coloration. So the cryptic uh, coloration is a camouflage color that helps the organism to hide and in order to confuse the predators. So here are some examples. We have uh, this tree frog. I'm not really sure this. I'm not really sure what this is. Um, and then the, this fish. Aposematic coloration is a warning color that tells the predator that I'm poisonous. But there's a there's a possibility that the the pretty colored organism is isn't actually poisonous, so it may or may not be poisonous. But the uh, but the information that the predator gets is this organism is poisonous. I better avoid it. So we have the poison dart frog, uh, the snake, and skunk. So they all have colors that warn the predator. Under the category of aposematic coloration, there are two different types of aposematic coloration. 
there's a Bayesian and there's the Mullerian mimicry. Um, for so Bayesian and Mullerian uh, are named because the person who actually found out about these two types of mimicry, um, they're named. Their, their names were Bayesian and Mullerian. So for Bayesian um, mimicry is when a species is representing uh, a harmful species, but the organism itself isn't actually harmful. So as an example, this snake is actually poisonous, but this um, hawk moth larva, which is a little caterpillar larva, looks like this snake, but it isn't actually po uh, poisonous. So this is very good for the 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 species mimic mim, uh, mimicry, right? But it's not it doesn't really have an effect on the original species. And the next one is called Mullerian mimicry, where two species represent each other. They have similar warning color patterns, and they're both poisonous. So this is actually really good for both species because as a predator, a predator might try to eat this uh, cuckoo bee and find out that it's poisonous and then it might uh, try to eat this yellow jacket and also find out it's poisonous so because both uh, species are both are po uh, because both species are poisonous it kind of reinforces uh, the idea that they're all poisonous which makes the predator even more scared and it's really good um, it's a really good result for these two species. And it kind of reinforces um, their venom as well. It makes both species more and more venomous. So this next one is herbivory. Herbivory is also a plus minus interaction. One benefits, one uh, gets harmed. So as an example, we can have a, an aphid intruding a sap. And here we have an experiment on why some plants might have a very hairy pod or a very hairy leaf. So actually having those hairy leaf or bean pod help um, help the plant get rid of some of the, the aphids or other herbivores trying to eat this plant. So here, uh, here this experiment is showing you you can have a very hairy pod and the result is it only gets 10% damage from, from uh, the aphid. If you have a slightly hairy pod, it gets a medium damage, and if you have a bald pod, you have a 40% damage. So this tells you that evolutionarily, um, the development of those, those hairy pod or hairy leaf help prevent um, some herbivores from eating the plant. This next one is symbiosis. Symbiosis have three different types. Uh, there's the mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. Mutualism is a plus-plus interaction where both species get to benefit from this interaction. A parasitism is a plus-minus interaction where only the parasite get to benefit from these, this interaction and the, the host actually gets harmed. Commensalism is when one species gets benefit and the other one uh, doesn't really get effect either in the positive way nor in the negative way. So the first one is mutualism. Everybody wins. Here are some examples. The first one is uh, ant on this acacia tree. So there are these ants living on the acacia tree. It's good for the ants because the ants get a place to live. And um, it's good for the, the tree as well because the ants help protect the tree. The, the ants sometimes can... Uh, help fight off while well, the can bother some of the herbivores trying to eat this tree and also um, there's a recent research done on some some certain types of the acacia tree that the ants actually help increase the immunity of the tree to certain pathogens but we don't really know why this is yet However, there are also ants that are, that, are parasit, uh, that are parasites to those trees. But there are, there are also ants that are mutualistic to the trees. Um, what is this one? Uh, the, here, uh, here, here's the acacia tree and the ants. And then this one is uh, sea anemone with clownfish. It's very interesting because sea anemone is actually uh, an animal 
that attaches to the rock and it secretes a lot of poison that um, kills other fish. So if another fish, if a different fish that's not a clownfish goes to the sea anemone, an it will get poisoned and then it would uh, die and then the sea anemone would, uh, would eat it with its tentacles. However, clownfish, there's a, there's a debate on whether clownfish are born with the immunity to sea anemone venom or um, it uh, acquired the trait. So one thing that scientists say is that the clownfish would go to the sea anemone and have its body touch a little part of the sea anemone. And then this increases, well, so the, the fish does get poisoned a little bit, but this allows the clownfish to secrete a certain mucus that forms a protective layer, um, which make them immune to the venom in the future. And then the clownfish, so in this relationship, the clownfish is benefiting because they get to live at the sea anemone and it can avoid other predators by hiding in the sea anemone. But it's also good for the sea anemone because um, those tentacles actually don't really move on its own. It only moves uh, with the sea current. So the problem that that's created by them, the tentacles not being able to move on its own is that sometimes it could create a oxygen depleting area where there's not a whole lot of oxygen since there's not enough um, flow of water sometimes. And with the clownfish going in and out, it uh, helps increase the amount of water flow, which then increase um, the possibility of the sea anemone getting enough oxygen at a certain area. So the clownfish, um, previously scientists thought that clownfish sleeps at night and it doesn't really move a whole lot, but in fact, clownfish actually moves a whole lot at night. It moves um, as it's sleeping, kind of. And as it's moving, it helps um, move around the tentacles and help it get oxygen. And the clownfish also eats away the dead parts of a uh, sea anemone, and as well as the other leftover fish particles, to, which keeps the sea anemone clean. So it's good for everyone. Uh, just some, some interesting examples. This next one is called parasitism, a plus minus interaction. Uh, the first one is a wasp blowfly larva. So the wasp would put his larva into the blowfly and then kind of uh, make it its own. And then the wasp larva is able to grow a whole lot better than the blowfly larva. The brood parasitism is interesting. The brood parasitism is any time when you have a certain organism that doesn't really take care of its own um, children. It makes another species of some sort take care of his children. This happens to birds, it happens to animals, uh, other types of animals, it also also happens to fish. Um, so in this example we have a bird egg that's similar in shape as the other bird egg, but the result, so the result is the other bird um, would think that this bird is their own child and then it will raise it and feed it. And then the other bird, the actual parent, get to get to get away with not having to do his parenting job. And this is really good for the, the original parent because parenting takes a lot of energy and any way that you can avoid spending too much energy is good for the, the individual. Um, there are certain ways that birds can prevent, um, that can prevent this, this invader bird to be a part of its, um, its uh, offspring. So one mechanism that certain birds use is that it will realize that it's not that this egg is not a part of their offspring and it will kick the egg out of the tree. Um, another way is that there are certain birds that can teach the unborn uh, fetus birds a certain song that only the mother and well the, the parents and the actual offspring can recognize and then this big ugly bird is going to have a different song and then the uh, the parent bird will know that this is wrong and it will not feed the invader. Um, uh, another interesting one is a cuckoo bird would actually um, if the if the other bird the uh, the other parent 
don't raise the cuckoo bird uh, offspring, then the cuckoo bird um, parents would actually come and destroy the whole the whole uh, nest um, because because the other parent is not doing their parent job. Um, so there are a lot of interesting that go on with brood parasitism. The, the example with fish is that there's fish that will lay egg, uh, there's catfish that will lay egg into the, the egg colony of a different fish. And then this fish would put all the egg in their mouth. And uh, this catfish egg actually hatches way earlier than all of the other, the actual offspring, actual fish. So then it will actually eat some of the their offspring, and then the the mother would raise the catfish baby without any of their own baby. So it's really sad. So you can look into this; it's really interesting. Um, and then there's mosquitoes. We all know that mosquitoes are bad. Oh, this is a video that I strongly recommend you to watch. It is very interesting. Um, so you can take a look. So basically, you have uh, a wasp that would put his egg into um, a caterpillar and then the caterpillar, the wasp baby is going to burst out of the ca caterpillar skin. And, um, and then the caterpillar also is going to help preventing other, in, um, other predators from eating the wasp baby. So you can, you can take a look at this video. Um, the commensalism is a plus zero interaction where one of the species doesn't get benefit or get harmed. So an example is buffalo. Um, when the water buffalo walks around the, the grass, they really stir up the populations of insects on the grass because the insects is kind of feeling the effect of a, of a small um, earthquake and all the insects are all going all crazy and coming out. And these birds, these birds would follow the buffalo population and eat the insects that got stirred up. So the buffalo is just going about its day, eating grass and walking around, but these birds are benefiting from just the buffalo doing their regular job. So the, the birds are the benefits. They get to eat the insects that got stirred up. Um, here's another example, uh, nesting bird and tree. Um, the bird get to nest on the tree, but it really doesn't uh, do a whole lot of damage to the tree itself. So this is commensalism. This last type of species interaction is called facilitation, where two species are benefiting from each other, or one species is benefiting and the other one is not affected, but they're not live in close prox uh, approximation. So there's not a symbiotic relationship, it's a little bit different. Um, an example is lichen. Uh, lichens are often grown on trees and um, rocks, even when there's nothing, when there's no nutrition um, on the rock whatsoever, and they're able to grow very easily. And this is good because the lichens can actually secrete a certain chemical that breaks down the rock and stones. And this chemical allows, um, so after the stones and the, the rocks break down, they will become a part of the soil. And the lichen itself also supports, um, well, as the lichen breakdown, there's also a little bit of nutrition entering the soil. And this is good for whatever plant that grows in the soil later on. Um, and so the lichen is the one contributing. So it could be, it has no effect really on the lichen, but the, uh, but the plants growing later on is benefiting from this relationship. Another example is the salt marsh with juncus. So juncus are these grassy um, plants uh, in North America, salt marsh. What it's doing is that there's a, the salt marsh might uh, have certain problems. There might be too much salt, there might be not as much water, uh, there might also be a lack of oxygen. And having the juncus uh, really help retaining the oxygen, well it sends the oxygen into the soil a little bit, and it uh, helps preventing salt buildup at the salt marsh, and it helps water to retain. So the, the experiment that's done is that with juncus in this same area, you would have a higher number of plant species, a more diverse plant species. Uh, without juncus, there's not gonna be as much plant species because there's simply too much salt, not enough oxygen, um, not as good of a habitat for the organisms.
The last one is beavers. Um, beavers build their own homes, which is just things that beavers do. However, it's really good for other organisms because it really creates a lot of micro uh, ecosystem for the other fish and um, other types of organism living in the same area.